Thank All right. <laughs> thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are really happy to be here today, and thank you for attending our, our little talk. This is the first time we're going to do this talk, so uh, please be, uh, be uh, patient if uh, it's a bit rusty sometimes. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a project we've done uh, for one of our clients, uh, we, which we called Model as Code. Uh, the, the aim of this project was to, um, to develop an approach on how to uh, um, automate the deployment of our models into different production environments. So first, a little bit, uh, a little word about Contmetry. Contmetry is a young startup. We are three years old now, <laughs> and uh, we are consulting uh, in data science in, uh, based in Paris. So we help our clients uh, with their ana analytical data project uh, and so on. This is going to be a two-person uh, speech. So uh, first, uh, so there's going to be uh, Isabel, uh, a data scientist at, uh, at Quartmetry, and, uh, and me, uh, who is also working for Quartmetry uh, as, a, as a, a consultant. So uh, just for an introduction and for, uh, for having a little bit of context, uh, usually, what we see uh, at our clients and how they deal their data science project and their, all their analytical project is that they have uh, two separated environments for, uh, for, um, for doing their, uh, their different analytical projects. Uh, usually, they have the, their production uh, environment where they have, have all their business uh, use cases. This is where they have their typical RDBMS. Sometimes they, have, they use Hadoop in production and different, different uh, systems for, for, their, for their production. And then on the other end, as a sandbox, there's a develop, development platform. Sometimes we call it Data Lab. Uh, this is where we are going to uh, gather and centralize all the data. And this is where uh, all data scientists will, uh, will develop their model, develop uh, the insight from, uh, from, their, from the data they have in their company. So I'm just going to present a little bit fast uh, the different steps of those kind of projects. Those are actually quite typical steps. The first step is usually to first collect the different data sources. Uh, sources can be external sources or internal sources. Uh, then to, you have to store the, those data sources into RDBMS, into uh, our NoSQL engine, or even sometimes the file system of your development environment, and sometimes even Hadoop. Then you, you do use the pre-processing, the different uh, first big analysis. And this is where you're going to make your data talk with each other and uh, get rid of any duplicates if needed, and so on. And then there's a predict step. Uh, this is where usually the data scientist um, uses, use R or Python to, uh, to produce a predictive model uh, on the data that they just uh, gathered and uh, organized a little bit. And finally, usually in those kind of projects, there's the real-life test on the model they just uh, developed uh, to say, OK, if, uh, is the model good enough for our business? Uh, does it meet the, the requirement we, we wanted? So if not, we'll go back to a full cycle. And if yes, what happens? What, what do we do now that we are happy with our model? So this is going to be the question of this talk today. Um, what about deployment? Usually, we see a lot of clients that struggle with this question and say, OK, my data scientists are ready. They know R, they know Hadoop, and so on. But what next? Uh, they, they are afraid of, uh, of, uh, of the model being stay stuck in, uh, in those kind of sandbox. So usually, uh, the classical approaches to tackle this problem is to uh, first uh, record the, the model. Once it's trained uh, on R or Python, then you can uh, get your results back and say, OK, I will uh, implement the different coefficient of my, uh, my linear regression and so on into SQL, C++, and Java. This, this is fine. Works well, of course. It takes a bit of time. And you can also use the PMML standard, which is a um, kind of a, a norm which allows you to write any, a lot of models into an XML file. And then you can use an API such as open scoring to uh, read back your XML file and do the scoring, uh, scoring on your different platforms. But PMML is fine, but uh, what about non-supported models? Not all models are, support, be, are able to be written into, uh, into XML. And uh, some production environment doesn't speak uh, PMML, so it's not a really a general, general approach. So for this problem, who, uh, who did it bother? 
uh, our client was a player in the French uh, energy industry, and uh, he did uh, he built model for predicting uh, consumption uh, consumption uh, into aggregates part of uh, France. And they were really happy with their model, and they, they didn't want us to, uh, to improve it, which, uh, which, uh, which is fine for some time. And uh, as you can see, uh, you, the model they, they, they use, in the orange line, they have the predicted uh, consumption, and in blue, the, the realized, uh, realized uh, the observed uh, consumption. So uh, this works well. But, and this is uh, where the problem is, they, they're really happy with their model, and they don't want to change uh, anything. And what they do is that they use, for this uh, kind of use case, uh, what we call GAM model. GAM is a generalized uh, additive model. It's uh, a model that's trying to fit uh, on any variables uh, of your data, data set. It was going to try to fit a function that it has into its, uh, its uh, library. So um, they use a very specific R package called MGCV, uh, which is not supported by PMML, and that the results are not easily uh, read, uh, re -recode recodable. It, you cannot recode uh, that easily those kind of functions that uh, R model uh, uh, uses. So, um, so they, they asked us: uh, Is there any way for for uh, for uh, less to, to get less struggle with this uh, this step? And we had um, an approach in, in our mind for, for quite a while, and so and it was the time to, uh, to actually uh, say, okay, we, we have an idea which would, should work on paper, and uh, we'll, try, uh, we'll try with you and see how it goes. So the model has code, the name of the project. Uh, the, the goal is to directly deploy and use the R object for prediction. So the goal is to say, okay, I'm going to use my R object, which does the prediction, phase, the prediction step quite easily, and I'm going to deploy it directly into my prediction environment and use it for my for my day-to-day -day, uh, analysis. Uh, to do so, uh, we set three goals in, in our mind. First, of course, we wanted to drastically uh, reduce the deployment time so that it is really take really less time than uh, recording uh, the, the model. We wanted the approach to be as general as possible. So for one environment, we wanted to, to put just one code uh, for any model we will submit after that. And uh, we wanted, of course, to be stable in performance. Uh, we didn't know if uh, stacking up uh, the production, uh, production service plus R plus the different uh, layer of this approach would be really stable in performance. So we wanted to be careful with that. So to go into a little bit more details, I'm going to let Isabel uh, talk for the next uh, part of, the, of this page. OK. Um, so I'll explain you first uh, the a few details about our approach, uh, how we designed it. So first thing first, you've got your uh, development platform where R is installed on it, and you've got your production platform where a service is running, let's say it's Teradata or Hadoop. Uh, so the first step is to serialize your, uh, your model. Um, this step is quite straightforward because uh, in R, for example, you've got the, some functions to Save RDS, save in RDS or save in RDA uh, format, which are serialized uh, format. So, once you've got your binary object, uh, you should deploy it to the production platform. This step is also quite easy because you just have to copy it to the production platform. But the most tricky step is when you want to do the prediction. In fact, you want to enable the communication between R and your service. So, first step is to install R in your production platform and then to enable the communication between the two. So um, you, for this, you will need uh, some specific tools. Fortunately, uh, in Java, there is a library that exists. It's called RJava, and it merges two projects, JRI, which enables to open a R session in Java. That's uh, the library we will use uh, uh, in this project. And RJava, which enables uh, to use Java in uh, your R session. So the name RJava bundles uh, both RJava and JRI. Um, then to use JRI, you just need to to use uh, to start uh, to start your R engine to to open your R session in Java. So we'll, you will just use the, the function get main engine, and then after that you just have to, to use you can use any R command in fact with uh, with the function evolve, 
and you just have to pass your R code into a parameter of uh, your function evil. So that's quite simple, in fact. But on our way to prediction, we realized that our objects, our models, the serialized models, were really quite heavy. Uh, in fact, it's because they carry everything for, for training. Uh, so uh, they really have uh, to... In fact, we, we just wanted to, to do the prediction uh, with these models, so we didn't need at all uh, all the data for training. So we decided to uh, remove all this metadata, all this hidden metadata, by iteratively, um, iteratively uh, removing uh, the, the data that was not used for that was not uh, necessary for a prediction. So, um, you, so you, you, can, uh, you can develop this approach in uh, several production environments. Uh, it could be a web service, Hadoop, a relational database, uh, complex even processing. In fact, the approach is quite general. So you could imagine uh, a lot of uh, production environments. Uh, but we decided, uh, in, in the time we had for uh, this short project, to, to develop two of these approaches, the web service and the Hadoop approach. So now I will talk about uh, the web service approach, uh, which was uh, done as a REST API. So how, how will uh, that work? First, you build your predictive model on R. Then you serialize and deploy it to your API thanks to a put request. Then you have to launch your prediction on new data thanks to a post request. Okay, so the architecture is quite simple. So you just, uh, it's just a um, classic uh, architecture. The only new thing is in the communication between R and Java, as we said earlier. So um, in your request, you have to, to enter three parameters. The type of the model, let's say it's a linear regression, logistic regression, a GAM model. Uh, you have to enter the ID of the model. In fact, it's the name of the RDS, si of the RDS file. And you have to enter uh, the JSON data. So this request goes to the model exposure class, which translates every HTTP request uh, into a call to a function which will deploy the, the R code. Um, then this deployer class uh, gathers all the functions uh, that can call the R code, thanks to JRI. And your data goes to the input-output class uh, that models your JSON data. Um, you will have three types of requests. The first, the get request, uh, which enables you to return all the available models in your API. The put request, which enables you to deploy a model uh, and load the necessary libraries uh, of in your API. And then the post request, which enables you to have the, the prediction uh, of your new data. Uh, this, uh, the design of these three requests was uh, kind of inspired of uh, another project, OpenScoring, which is an API for deploying PMML model. Uh, you can check their GitHub, and uh, there are quite a bunch of uh, interesting information there. So how about the post request? How do you do the prediction? Uh, first, you've got to read the data. So we chose to, 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 to do this kind of structure of JSON. So you can have several features possible. And you can, uh, your multiple rows are, uh, are in an array, in fact. And uh, in this API, we were able to score on double values uh, features. Then you have to convert this uh, JSON data to uh, data that R will understand. So thanks to our JSON I library, you will convert that to a R data frame. And then you have to load the model. So load the specific libraries according uh, to the type of your model. In our case, it was MGCV uh, library. And then you have to use the R function to read the model, to read the RDS file. OK, so now you're ready for prediction. You only have to, um, to use this R code uh, thanks to the JRI uh, library. So you only have to deploy this code. Uh, and in R, there, are, uh, there is only a function that is called predict, and that enables you to, uh, to predict on several, uh, several models any any, any type of model, in fact. So you only have to, to pass the parameter, the ID of the model, and the new data. 
Okay, so once you've done that, you do the same work and convert this data frame to JSON output. Okay, so I'll hand over to Mathieu for the big data approach. Uh, yeah, so the REST uh, API was really working really great. Uh, we had good results uh, because it was quite uh, dynamic. Uh, we, we will see, we'll talk a little bit about the result uh, later to, uh, for, to come up as a conclusion. And uh, so the, the second approach was more for a batch approach. What if you have uh, a lot, a lot of data to, uh, to score? What if you don't, don't just want to score aggregate part of France, but uh, maybe every single uh, household, maybe every single, uh, who knows, with the Internet of Things, every single fridge, who knows what they want to do next? So maybe the, they have a um, Hadoop cluster, so we, we thought it was a good idea to try to develop the, uh, the approach on a, on a Hadoop cluster. So first, um, there's, two, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to implement, uh, to make a communication between R and Hadoop. Uh, in, if, you are, if you want to split into two big families, there's a streaming uh, streaming's approach, uh, which works really well. It doesn't take a lot uh, to set up, it's easy to implement, but it uses uh, standard input and output to communicate between uh, your, your Hadoop uh, jobs and the, uh, the, R, uh, the R functions. Uh, and actually, we made it work in uh, just a couple hours just to find the right, uh, the right uh, line right here, uh, <laughs> to find the, the right jar in uh, the right Hadoop streaming jar. So, but we wanted to do, to do something a little bit more complex because we were quite concerned about the performance and the scalability of the approach, even though it's probably working really fine. So another big family of, uh, of uh, approaches that you can do on Hadoop is we're thinking about encapsulation. You can re rewrite a specific map produce jobs or a specific UDF. Uh, UDF, just, uh, just uh, as a reminder, it's a user-defined function. It's usually um, uh, something you find in uh, RDBMS, in databases, uh, where you can implement uh, your, your specific function in, uh, in uh, jar code or C++ code. And Hive and Pig, actually, uh, gives you the ability to write a UDF. So it is we thought better because we have a better control on uh, input data that will be sent between our different, uh, different HTFS file. Uh, it's going to be Java code that runs on Java code, so we like that. Uh, and it uses GRI, uh, as Isabel uh, told you, uh, to communicate between R and Java. And we started to, uh, to know a little bit uh, about this, uh, this library. So we went for the UDF, uh, UDF approach. And uh, just really quick, we won't go too much into too much detail of, uh, about this one. Uh, the general cycle we wanted to achieve uh, was to having Hive to launch the query with the UDF that we will, be, we will develop. And then the UDF first will have to deal with the input data, uh, see if there is null value, see uh, how many parameters will be sent into the, the UDF, uh, and organize the work for GRI for the next step. The UDF GRI part will deal the R session and uh, send instruction to R for the, for the scoring, uh, scoring phase. Then R score, score the, the line that it receives in, uh, as an input. And then all the, the results goes back up, down, down to Hive that aggregates all the, the results for all, all our different uh, files on HDFS, HDFS. Uh, to, be, uh, to go into more details about UDF, um, on Hive you can develop two types of uh, UDF, a simple one, uh, which is good, but there is also a, a, a bit more complex one, a bit more complex to write, but uh, which offers you a, a bit more of control of your, of your data. They are called generic UDF. Uh, I've read some, somewhere that it's supposed to be even better in performance than a regular UDF, so it might be even better. So it deals dynamic number of parameters, because once again, we wanted the approach to be general. So what if we change the model and the number of parameters inside the model changes? Then we, we, have the, we want the UDF to adapt in this kind of situation. It better with null value, and also it deals constant parameter better. Because well, as we will see, we, we are sending a constant, uh, a constant string in, uh, in our UDF to organize a little bit of the, of the work. So yeah, uh, we recommend to use a generic UDF uh, as a best practice. Um, first things first, uh, the setup phase. So for if you have a cluster uh, with multiple nodes, then, um, then uh, 
then you have to set up your environment for each, uh, each uh, Hadoop node. And so first, you have to install R and R Java in, uh, on every single node. You have to install the model required libraries, which in our case would be uh, MGCV. So of course, if you change your, your model, you, then you'll have to, uh, to uh, reinstall a, a specific library, I guess. And then you, yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but you, there, there were quite uh, uh, some, there were some environment and variable to set up. So I, they were down the slide if you want to, to try the approach. And uh, yeah, some file that you have to move into the Hadoop, uh, some Hadoop shard file, some shard li library. Yeah, use logs. Uh, it helped us to save a lot of time because uh, in the setup phase we, we did a lot of try and, uh, and error. And actually, uh, Hadoop logs are, are great, and uh, we there everything there, and the, the message are quite explicit when there's something that goes wrong or any variable that are not set correctly. Uh, if we uh, take the workflows, the workflow, classical workflow of the approach back, then uh, what about the serialize and deploy the model phase? Uh, as, you, as an illustration, if we save your, our model, uh, our R model, uh, as a, and we call it a new model, then uh, there's a save RDS phase which will uh, put you, uh, give you the RDS file. And uh, we will use the Hadoop distributed cache function to uh, deploy the model on every single uh, node of our, of our cluster. And uh, on Hive, it's, uh, it's uh, written like that. You just say hide file uh, model.rds, and then your, your file is, uh, is being distributed into the memory of every single node on, on your cluster. And for the prediction uh, step, uh, so just for an illustration, uh, if you got into much more detail about the, the model, when you train the model, in our case, uh, it was a GAM model, you say, OK, my model is a formula, and I want to predict the Y variable as an expression of um, uh, my first variable, R1, plus my, my second variable, R2. And when you want to call a prediction, you want to build a data, a data frame from your, from your new data. And then you call the predict function. This is uh, our specific. You, you, in, on any model, predictive model, any predictive model implements a predict uh, function. So it's quite ge generic. So you call your, your predict function on new model and uh, with your new new data. So what does the UDF do? Is actually uh, it's going just to do the mapping between uh, the expected value, the expected parameters in the R model and the different fields uh, from, uh, from our Hive table we want to, uh, to score. So it's basically pretty much it. Uh, we just take the, the, the constant, string, constant string we send to the, uh, to the UDF, and we do, we do the mapping between F1 and F2. So we say, OK, uh, we, we built a, a string, R1 equals F1, which is a Hive, uh, hive uh, column, and R2 equals uh, equal F2, which is another uh, Hive column. And then with GRI, we'll send the, the prediction uh, to R. So the whole Hive query looks like that. Uh, you, you add JAR with your, your different library JAR you use in your, in your UDF, plus the UDF, the add file, and then the, the select query looks like, uh, looks like that. It's very simple. <laughs> so now we are going to try to, uh, to, uh, to have a little demo, which we, we are, it's not going to be as impressive as the other one. We won't clap in our hand, but uh, <laughs> we will still uh, try to do something. OK. So um, yeah, I, I registered my, uh, my comments so that I don't mess up. If we, um, if this is a, a query I'm going to send to Hive to, uh, to actually uh, uh, query the data we have in our, our table we want to score. So let's say we want to, uh, to score this, uh, this table. So it's Hive, so hopefully we have a little bit of time. And uh, if, it, uh, if it's not that fast, then uh, we'll skip the demo part. <laughs> OK. So this is Hive. It does take quite a long, a long time. So this is real Hive. And we, we did develop it on a, on, a, on a VM, and we had quite good results already. So if, if let's say, we, have, we want to, uh, to score this table, and uh, the, our data set is being used to train the model looked like that. We had a, a time uh, which are, it's like a time series. Uh, the ID is the time value, and then there are second, uh, there are other variables that helped us to, uh, to build our model. Then, 
if we want to, to watch the, the query, just to, to, to show you I didn't lie to you, uh, it looks like that. Then you, you add your jars, you, and you, here's the query for this, uh, this specific, uh, this specific uh, case. So once again, uh, the constant string indicates which, uh, which model you want to use. So if you are, uh, your data scientist pr produced a new model, uh, which is called the uh, zone 1-1, uh, then uh, with, with these parameters, then you just have to say, OK, uh, my UDF, I call it with this string function and uh, the, the corresponding uh, variable from my Hive table. So if we send it to Hive, uh, also it's going to take a couple seconds, but uh, apparently it doesn't launch the uh, MapReduce jobs from the for the new uh, new version of Hives. Uh, when we developed it, it was on a, a bit older version of Hives, so every single time we we did some some test, we we had the typical MapReduce phase with a different percentage uh, going on. So there you go. I called the, the prediction on my, uh, my new data set. And uh, the results here shown in uh, prediction consu consumption uh, is the results of uh, R uh, using the RDS, uh, RDS file as a, as a model. So that's it for the demo. So I'm going to let uh, Isabel do the conclusion and perspective and finish, uh, finish the job. OK, so in fact, we realized that uh, these two approaches were uh, two complementary approaches. In fact, uh, the REST API is quite agile, and uh, you score quite fast on uh, a small amount of rows. But uh, once you, you've reached uh, the limit of the, the API, the UDF Hive approach um, is, uh, is really more uh, relevant uh, so because it scores uh, really fast on uh, a big amount of, uh, of rows. Uh, so both, both approaches are com complementary. So that is uh, what satisfied uh, the, the client in uh, this, uh, this project. OK, so for perspectives, we saw a lot of uh, quite cool tools uh, in the Berlin Buzzwords uh, conference. So that could be really, really nice to, uh, to test uh, the general uh, model code approach in these tools. And what about Python? So earlier uh, for the data science, uh, data science uh, process step, we talked about Python. Um, a lot of data scientists love Python. There's not only R uh, that, that enables you to, to do uh, analytical models. So what about it? Uh, could our approach uh, be generalizable <laughs> to, to Python? Um, we think that yes, because um, our DS uh, files, the serialization in R, uh, could be done with a pickle file in Python. And for JRI library, we could use R2Py, and for example, for the web service, we could have used Django. So we, we really think that uh, this, um, this approach would, uh, would fit also in, uh, in Python. So thank you for your attention. And uh, now it's time for lunch or questions, if you have some. <laughs> <laughs>